Good evening, everyone. Today's theme is kaalaman tungkol sa HIV, tuberculosis, bakuna, at nutrition. As a pediatric gastroenterologist, I will be sharing to you two guides which we can use in our clinical practice. These guides were developed by the Food and Nutrition Research Institute, collected from Philippine data and designed for use for Filipinos. They say that food is life. Eating right is necessary for one's health. Food security is also a necessity for society to progress. It has been that way throughout human history. Healthy eating has been associated with better health outcomes for children, mothers, and the workers. Healthy children learn better, healthy adults are more productive, and the society benefits as a whole. A healthy diet should give one the right amount of each nutrient needed for body functions. The right amounts of nutrient will vary between individuals depending on their age, gender, physical activity, culture, and the available food in their surroundings. But despite these differences, certain principles of healthy eating remains the, the same. When you have too little or too much of a certain nutrient, you will have malnutrition. Excess in energy or calories from macronutrients like your carbohydrates and fats will result to excess weight. Too little calories will result to poor weight gain or weight loss. These changes will be apparent as wasting or in the other end of the spectrum as obesity. However, deficiencies in certain micronutrients like iron or ascorbic acid may not be present uh, with obvious weight changes, but with subtle signs like pallor or bleeding. In the Philippines, we see the double burden of malnutrition, underweight and overweight individuals in all age group. For the less than five years old, Cagayan de Oro has lower percentage for stunting, but higher percentage for wasting and overweight for height children. For the school age, wasting and stunting in CDO are below the national average but still stunting remains high at more than 20%. We also have a higher prevalence of obesity in the five to 10 years old Cagayan de Oro kids. The prevalence of stunting continues to increase in our teens, locally and in the national level. And obesity is also seen around in about 10% of our teenagers. This is a 2016 map showing stunting in the Philippines. And you see here that Mindanao has high to very high prevalence of stunting. If we look at women of reproductive age, about a third of them are overweight or obese. And the percentage is higher here in CDO. Also in our lactating mothers, obesity remains high. But it is not only in our women. In general, CDO already has a high prevalence of obesity pre-pandemic. One of the complications of obesity, hypertension, is seen in 15% of the working population. There has been no significant changes in the last 20 years. But what is noticeable is an increasing trend in our adults with high fasting blood sugar and CDO also follows the same trend. We also have a higher percentage of obese, hypertensive, and high uh, fasting blood uh, sugar among the elderly Cagayanos compared to the national figures. Hypertension and diabetes are non-communicable diseases in which nutrition plays a role. And nutrition starts from the womb as the pregnant women's diet not only affects their body, 
but also the baby that they are carrying. So babies uh, from birth to six months should ideally be exclusively breastfed and breastfeeding should continue up to two years and beyond. But by six months, the infant should start receiving complementary feeding with the right amount of go, glow, and grow foods. And this is also the time when we have to start training them proper eating habits. The first 1,000 days is crucial as this is the period of rapid brain and body growth. Getting the right amount of nutrients and establishing good eating habits is a must as this will impact their eating habits and their health outcomes later on when they reach adulthood. Traditionally, we Filipinos eat like our Asian neighbors and rice is our main source of carbohydrates. Vegetables are a mainstay in our meals. But lately, a lot of Filipinos have been eating more like Westerners. The Western diet is high in calories, fats, and proteins. And this type of diet has been associated with many diseases. Some of these diseases, like inflammatory bowel disease, once rare among Asians, are increasingly seen even among Filipino children. The FIT and the Kids study surveyed the diet of Filipinos, and this was published last 2018. And you see here that even in our toddlers, we have been giving a lot of sweetened beverages and pastries. Veggies are not even in the list. The preference for sweets, meat, and processed food is constant among all age groups. And this is pre-pandemic. So after COVID-19 reached our shores, due to a lot of lockdowns and restrictions, food delivery to our doorstep more or less became the norm. The food that we order from our Suki fast food chains are not exactly healthy. Several studies abroad have shown an increasing trend of obesity among children and adults. I encourage our students and residents to do our local research, but I guess I wouldn't be surprised if we also have the same trend locally. So what is a healthy diet for us Filipinos? We have several guides to help us. And one of them is your Philippine Dietary Reference Intake. And this was published by the Food and Nutrition Research Institute uh, last 2015. And this is our very own dietary reference intake. This contains the reference values for the different nutrients needed to satisfy the needs of healthy Filipinos. And you will see in the PDRI tables showing different reference values for calories, the macronutrients, and water specific for age and gender. Also included are reference values for your micronutrients, your vitamins and minerals. There are also recommendations there to limit the intake of free sugars. And these free sugars are those that we use to sweeten our pastries, colas, iced coffees, milk tea, and we should limit uh, the use of free sugars to less than 10% of the total calories that we take every day. We know that excess amount of free sugars in the form of concentrated fructose is associated with central obesity, glucose intolerance, and fatty liver. It is also recommended that we limit sodium intake to less than two grams per day and increase our potassium intake to more than 3.5 grams per day. The acceptable macronutrient distribution range also included in the PDRI shows the ideal proportions of the macronutrients in our diet. When you compare our AMDR to that of the American AMDR, our diet contains less proteins, around 15%, and more carbs. And this is because we eat less meat and more rice than them. It is difficult to put into use the values that we see on the dietary reference intake tables, right? And more so for our patients. Thus, our dietitians have made food pyramids for us to picture the right amount of a certain food group to eat. We see on the top of the pyramid 
the foods, we try to eat less. And as we go down the down to the base, uh, the amount of that certain food group uh, should be eaten more often. The pyramid is our guide for our daily ration. Yet, most of us don't really think of our daily food intake, right? Thus, the food plate model. No? So we have our very own Pinggang Pinoy. It is an easier to understand food guide compared to the food pyramid. And we can see the right proportions of food groups in a plate. Of course, each is expected to consume only one plate per meal. Thus, the proportions equate to a per meal basis. Half of the plate are your glow foods, your veggies and your fruits. And the other half consists of your go food, your carb sources like your rice, and your grow food, meat sources like uh, chicken, uh, beef, or pork for your proteins and fats. And also included uh, is the pantula, your water. You can Google Pinggang Pinoy and search for the FNRI web page, and there you can download Pinggang Pinoy guides for the different age groups. We have Pinggang Pinoy for kids, three to 12 years old, for our teens, adults, elderly, and the pregnant and lactating women. So the PDF that you can download for free also includes a meal plan for breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snacks. And shown here are the meal plans for your children ages three to five, six to nine, and 10 to 12. The amount of food that the child eats increases as he or she grows older, but the proportions of the food groups remain the same. And here are the meal plans for your teens, adults, elderly, and the pregnant and lactating mothers. So aside from the sample meal plans, you have their different food groups uh, or food included in the food groups of the go, glow, and grow category and the amount of each food recommended per serving. It is also recommended we drink at least eight glasses of water per day, drink less sweetened, sweetened beverages, and eat less salty, fried, fatty, and sugar-rich food. And also, it is recommended that we stay physically active. So diet goes hand in hand with physical activity. And we see here uh, the activity pyramids for children and adults. The top of the pyramid includes activities we shouldn't be doing often like watching TV or using our computers and gadgets for leisure. So your Korean and Turkish telenovelas will kill you. Ah, joke. Uh, for our kids, we make them do household chores and make sure that they have activities for aerobic and resistance exercises. But it would be best if we plan activities that the whole family can do because we adults also need physical activities. Of course, we should consider the COVID-19 health protocols when we plan these activities. So diet and exercise is just a part of getting a healthy lifestyle. I personally use the 5210 equals 8 guide when I advise my patients and their families uh, on how to have a healthy lifestyle. If we do this routinely for at least two months, eat five or more fruits or vegetables per day, uh, limit our recreational screen time to two hours per day or less, uh, having one hour or more of physical activity, uh, not uh, getting to drink sugary drinks and drinking more water and or low-fat milk and getting at least eight hours of sleep uh, each night, then this habit becomes a lifestyle. So let me end with these quotes for everyone. Taking care of our bodies is not being selfish. It is necessary for our self-preservation. And during this pandemic, we have been busy taking care of our patients that we forget taking care of our own health. Taking care of ourselves physically and mentally is necessary so we can continue giving health care for our patients. Thank you and good evening.